you shall anoint as prophet in your place. See the assignment? Uh, how, 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 many, how many men? Three men. Are they all new? Are these all three new men? From the three men, we, listen, we met three men a moment ago. I say a moment ago, uh, a couple weeks ago. We met King Ahab, Obadiah, and Elijah, right? What were these three men supposed to do? Lead a spiritual reformation. These three men are out, and three new men are in to do what? Lead a spiritual re uh, reformation. Got three new guys. Here's your new assignment. In that assignment, is Elijah part of that? Is Elijah one of the three men, new men? No! He's been benched. No, I just thought we'd look at that. It shall come about that the one who escapes this, the new assignment goes on. It shall come about the one who escapes from the sword of Azarel, uh, Jehu, shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha, shall put to death. Now, he gets back to Elijah and why he's going to bench him. They bench him? He's still going to practice. He's still part of the team, but he benched him. Right? He pulled up another player out of the prophets. Out of all these prophets, he pulled up another prophet. He benched him and pulled up another prophet. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel. We call that a remnant or a pivot. All the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. What was, what was Elijah's famous line? Right? Benched. In the biggest game of his life. In the biggest game of his life. Benched, not due to injury, due to rebellion, to the will of God. See, that's pretty tough. Well, it's what happens when your spiritual mature believer got the capacity to do the will of God and choose not to do it. A message for all of us. Let us pray. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude types of sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. Huh? What do I do? To get out of carnality and back into spirituality, which is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Your body has become the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there. John 14, 16, he dwells there forever once he takes up residence. How do I get back? Confess my sin. You're a priest, 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. You're a priest in this dispensation called the church. Under the new covenant, as a believer in the church, you're a priest. Under the high priesthood of Jesus Christ, you have the right to confess sin. You have the right to pray over others' sin. To bring them to a place in their life where they understand that they need to confess their sin to get out of carnality and get into spirituality. You have a responsibility to explain that to people as I am to you. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sins or if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. The key is that word cleansing takes us to the cross of Christ. For the believer, when I confess my sin, I'm cleansed, not for salvation, but for spirituality. Let's do that. Well, Father, we thank you for your love, mercy, and grace. And we thank you, Father, for the propitious work of Christ on the cross extended to the Christian's life by confession of sin to restore us to spirituality, the great ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church age under the new covenant. 
I pray today the Holy Spirit would teach and recall, uh, would reveal to us and disclose to us the great things of the Word of God that would transform our life, not reform us, but transform us into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, the dynamics of the visibleness of God in our life. Others can see the evidence. It can see the witness of our relationship with you and would be attracted and drawn to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we, we looked at our text. God is still interested in launching a spiritual reformation in the nation of Israel. And he's benched the first three and brought on a whole new team. A whole new team is going to play the second half. A whole new team using a... Uh, football season metaphor. You see, Elijah's problem wasn't that he was running from Jezebel. He was running from God. Jezebel should have been no threat to him. She had no authority over his life at all. I, I explained that in great detail. But you see, the devil runs by fear and God runs by faith. So every time fear dominates you, you're being dominated by the world system of thinking. We call that old man, cosmos diabolic is thinking. Fear should never dominate your life. Not one day, not one moment, not one second should fear ever dominate your life. It can flash into your mind. Something can happen and you can be afraid. You got to catch yourself out of inner dialogue and go like, no, I'm not going there. Faith never conquers anything. I mean, uh, fear never conquers anything. Faith conquers everything. I was telling you, don't do what Elijah did because you're going to dig a hole that might bury you. It might cave in on you. So God is ready to launch a spiritual reformation, and he's put a new team up to do it. He's still running for a national title <laughs> in metaphor. We still have a shot at a national title, and uh, I'm putting a whole new team in. And uh, they're going to be a tough team. They're going to be a tough team, and they're, they're going to be a successful team. God said a teaching angel, you remember to get Elijah out of his spiritual slumber in order to give him a new assignment in the plan of God. He was instructed to take a 40-day journey to the mountain of God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I want you to write these down. I don't know if I wrote this down in your paper. I spoil you so bad. I probably did, but I may not have. Deuteronomy 1.22. Be sure you write that down because they're going to tell you something important to where Elijah is and where he's going. Deuteronomy 1.22 says that from Kadesh, from, uh, Kadesh Barnea, up there where he is now, it's an 11-day journey to Mount Horeb. 11-day journey. How many days did God give him? That's a whole lot of R&R &R to get his act together, isn't it? He's still on assignment, isn't he? You know who's going to pick the new team? Who has been assigned to pick the next team to play for a national championship? Elijah. 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 Right? Now, how many days is he already? It's an 11-day journey. He's already, what, one day in it, isn't he? So, ma mathematically, God gave him four times the amount of time he needs to get, get there, right? I'm not good at math, and you know that. But four times the amount of time for him to get his act together because he's still, he's, he's still got a job to do, hasn't he? He's benched him from the spiritual reformation. He's going to raise up a whole new team to do the spiritual reformation, get the national title. 
but he's still got a job to do. You know why? Because he's still got air in his lungs. He's got Nisha Mahaim. God, God breathed. He's still, he's still in the, he, listen, as long as you got air in your lungs, God's got, God's got a plan and you can participate in it. You may not be the top dog anymore, but you still are going to participate in it. Right? He gives him four times the amount of time he needs to get there to get his act together because he's still on, he's still got an assignment. His job is to pick. I'm going to tell you who to pick, and you go pick them. It's called anointing. It's a prophetic job to say God has selected you to do a, a specific thing. Do you know that every person in this room right now, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead as a source of your salvation, if you believe that to be saved, you've been anointed for a specific ministry in your life. Do you know that? And it may not be spectacular. It may not be a Billy Graham or somebody like that. But it's just as important in the plan of God. Do you know what that purpose for your life is? There's a purpose for your life. There's a purpose. And listen, you may have never thought about it until today. Your life is not without purpose, and the reason you still have air in your lungs is for you to find it and do it. Every, every person in the church age, listen, every person in here as a believer has a spiritual gifted ministry to the church. Is that right? By the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, you have a responsibility to the unbeliever of the world. Agreed? You're an ambassador for Christ of the gospel. There are things. Listen, I just mentioned two that everybody in this room has. There are purposes in your life. Besides that, there is a destiny purpose. There is something about your life, the makeup of it, the composition of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, that God has taken, redeemed, transformed to do a specific something in your heart that's unique to leave a, a, a footprint on the beach or in the snow or however, wherever, whatever you think. A footprint. Every person named in the Bible has an opportunity to do that. Ruth, Naomi, uh, Naomi Ruth, Tamar. I just happened to just go through women that had ba babies, but. But babies that were important to the messianic plan of God. See, there's some things, there are a lot of purposes you have that God has singled you out. Spiritual gift for the church, uh, ambassadorship for the world priesthood for prayer. I mean, there are things that you have that we all have responsibilities with. I mean, I function as a pastor. That's not my destiny. That's my gift. I mean, what is it that God has signaled out my life to do? Look, Elijah He's a prophet. What's his destiny? What, did, what was the destiny God wanted for his life? A spiritual reformation. I want you to lead a spiritual reformation. But he dropped the ball on him. He dropped the ball in a strategic time in his life. He dropped the ball and he was benched because of his spiritual maturity, because of the key role he had at that point. And, and God could not trust him. Because Elijah can't trust himself with the word of God. They benched him. 
he's still going to use him as a prophet. But he's lost a destiny part of it. And from this point on, Elijah's going to fade. As soon as these new guys are appointed, they're going to dominate the space. When, when he gets through anointing these three, these three are they're going to control the rest of the life space of Elijah. It's the reason I covered his life in the early part of his life, not the latter part of his life. Well, you can study the Bible. I mean, I have. I've read the whole story. <laughs> And it's a good one. And it's a good one that you should be aware of, and it's a one that you should pay attention to. You and I both. I can tell you that. 40-day journey. Uh-huh. 40 days. Four times the amount of time it's going to take to go. I mean, what God's trying to do is trying to get him back on track. We still got a job to do. When, listen, when he gives him his assignment and he lists these three, three guys, he's got to go like, well, wait a minute. I'm not one of those three. Nope. He could have been. But you can't play the second half. I can't, I can't trust you to play the second half. And so he points to him. Like with Jesus. This 40 days of spiritual reflection is really important for ministry. It is dependent on God's word and grace for ministry to a nation. A nation that would put Jesus Christ to death over religious jealousy while at the still time looking for a savior. Is that, is that not insane? I gave you scriptures that would be well worth your read in there, Matthew 4. Matthew 27, Luke 23, John 1, all those passages, I gave you specific scriptures, but those are great passages. I want to talk about four things on this new assignment. I want to talk about the meeting on your paper. I want to talk about the meeting. I want to talk about the message. I want to talk about the mantle, and I want to talk about the men. Uh, a four-point homiletical point. And I want you to study with me. I want you to study with me. Here's the meeting. It's in the 19th chapter. It's in verses 8 through 10. God invited Elijah to a special meeting on a special mountain of God. Right? This is a special meeting. God has invited him to a special meeting on God's mountain retreat. God's mountain. In verse 8 and 9, really verse 9, where did God find Elijah? Hiding in a cave on his mountain. Hiding in a cave on his mountain. Hiding. God has things for mountains, doesn't he? We're at Mount Carmel, now we're at Mount Horeb. Where did God find him? He found him hiding in a cave, on his mountain, in a cave. What was Elijah doing? Lodging. <laughs> and ever he's prepared to stay a while. He's preparing to stay a while. It's a cal imperfect in the Hebrew. Yeah, he's, he's on R&R. &R. What did he have to do on Mount Carmel for success? Show up, believe in God, trust God. Who did all the work at Mount Carmel? The prophets of Baal on one side and God on the other side, right? <laughs> Listen, you know what the cave is? Lodging. You know what that says? He went to the mountain of God, got in a cave because he's insecure. But he should have climbed to the top of that mountain, 
on the summit met with God, right? It's God's mountain. I'll say, but what does it matter if it's God's mountain? God is where your security is. It's never... It's where you put your heart, not where you put your body. Yeah, he's resting. It's been, it's been through a tough time. No, nah, listen, your tough time, Elijah, you've created it. It's self-induced misery. All, all the stuff that's going on in your life, you're caused it yourself. You want to blame her? Oh, the sons of the sons of Israel, boy! They, they, <laughs> you know, every time you stick one finger out, you got the other sticking back, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, says, be careful about that. How did God reveal Himself to Elijah? This is a big one. This is a gate question. Um, not in a mile. How did He do this? It, we're in a cave now. How did He do this? The word of the Lord showed up. Don't miss that. And who was the word of the Lord? It, it, later, it says he was the Lord, right? It is Christ. It's the visible. It's a, a, appearing as a voice. How did God reveal himself? The word of the Lord, the Bible says. What question did God ask Elijah? Why what? Why are you here? What are you doing here? Well, Elijah could have said, because I was told to come here. Nah, you were told to come to the mountain, not to make a lodge out of, out of a cave. But why, why, why are you here? See, that's a good question. Listen, it's always to get a point across, a question, a rhetorical question, to get a point across. What do you hear? God wanted to hear the truth of the word of God come back. Listen, anytime God wants a question from you, he wants a, an answer of the word of God back from you. The word of the Lord came to him. What he, what's he want from you is the word of the Lord back, right? He wants a doctrinal answer. He, he asked a, do, he's asked a question to get a doctrinal answer. The word, listen, God, all, you can't pray apart from the will of God, can you? Not get an answer. Of course, you can pray, but you can't get an answer. To get, for God to hear an answer, you got to pray according to his will. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the way God works. God works through the will of God. The will of God is what? It's the whole deal. The whole deal to your life is what do you know about the will of God for your life? You've got to put your head in the word for the word to get in your heart because it is from the heart, Ephesians 6, 8, 6, 6. It is from the heart that God is looking for the will of God to be cycled back. Believe it, hear it, apply it, complete it. It's the faith cycle. God wants to hear in a prayer. He wants to hear the word of God. You're asking for something. You've got to ask according to the will of God. Where does, you, where does the will? It comes from the word. You can't know the will apart from the word. The word of God takes you to the will of God. The will of God takes you to the work of God. That's how the system works, and that's not working in Elijah's life that way, and it's got to work in your life that way. This is the purpose of the story. What are you doing here? That's a, listen, the directive will of God has to have three things lined up. Geographical will, what are you doing here? It's got to have the mental will of God, what are you doing here? It's got to have the operational will of God, what are you doing here? I mean, the here is the operational, the doing, right? What are you doing is the operational, and the, what the mental will of God is, is what he wants stated. Now, he'll take the directive will of God. What are you doing here geographically? How are we going to do it? Listen, who you got to reform in this room, in this cave? It's cute. You've got it looking cute. Apparently, you intend to stay. Who gave you permission to even get in the cave to start with? And who's giving you permission to stay here? This is my mountain. This is not your mountain. This is the mountain of God. 
Well, you'd show me a little respect. <laughs> well, yeah, well. See, anytime you have the directive will of God, and the directive will of God for Elijah was, I want a spiritual reformation. We're going to do a spiritual awakening for a spiritual reformation. <laughs> Boy, I'm telling you, if you think this is all about COVID, if you're all tied up in COVID, you're missing the point. It was never about the drought. It's never about the COVID. You people are nutter in a fruitcake. God is in control of all this stuff. Either God is or God isn't. Come on. Got all this stuff. You listen, you're listening to the wrong people. You're listening to the media. Put fear in your heart. Fear in your heart takes away faith in your heart. My goodness. Well, you know. Bunch of unbelievers trying to dictate to you how to live. We've gone way past science, by the way. This is no more, this, this is no more about science. Everybody's got a dog in the fight now. Everybody's a hunter. Jeez. Listen, this, this thing is no more about what it appears any more than the drought was, apart from the word of God. This whole thing is to bring a nation in the south. It's got to bring, the south has got to rise again for Jesus Christ. Live in a cave, in a hole in the ground, or a in a hole in a mountain? Nothing's changed in your life with God. Bother me that you wear a mask, do or don't. I don't care. It's your life. Fear is what I worry about. Because fear destroys faith. I think you social distance. I think you can wash your hands. I think these are things you do in any, any flu season. These are common sense things. I'm not opposed to that. I'm opposed to you having fear in your heart. It depends on why you do what you're doing. If you're motivated by fear, we got a real problem. We got a real problem in this church because there's too many people going to be benched. I ain't got enough to play now. Look around you. Look at you do what you want, but don't take the fear out. You put faith in there. Do not let your life be dominated by fear. What am I going to do? I lost my job. God. What am I going to do? I lost my help. God. I lost my help. God. Lost my help. Lost. Anytime you talk about loss, if you want to find gain, you got to find God. Philippians 1, 21 through 23. What I once called lost, I now call gain. Why? God. I don't know why I'm hollering. I just hollering. Makes me feel better, I guess. I don't know. I still think the internet might not hear me if I don't holler. At some point, I've got to wake up, don't I? So he asked him, what are you doing here? And what did he do? He gave him complaint. Oh, I'm zealous for you. Oh, yeah, that's why I'm benching you. <laughs> oh, I'm zealous for you. Mm, yeah, that's why I'm benching you. I'm benching you because... You're comparing yourself to other people. I'm jealous for the Lord. Yeah? Listen. Listen why he got that whole thing taken away. Uh, the sons of Israel. Boy, those, those sons of Israel. I, I guess he called them Israel. I don't know what he called them after son. Could have been a lot of names. Boy, I've been on the, I've really been going and blowing for you, Lord, but these people over here, these people you gave me, listen, I'm going to use those people to do a reformation. It's you I have to bench. I got to still use them. 
I, I'm after, I'm still after what I was after with you. I'm still after a spiritual reformation. <laughs> I just got to find somebody who'll play. What complaint did he give? You ought to read it carefully. It's six parts to it. See, you don't read the Bible. You read through it. Listen, when you read the Bible, it reads through you. You don't read through it. That's how you know you're reading the Bible. Because it reads you. It reads through you. For change. I got six points. I don't know where I'm getting. Not very far, apparently. Here's my first doctrinal point. The devil seeks permission from God to participate in the plan of God. Listen, the devil has, let's think about this. The devil has to seek permission to participate in the plan of God. Do you understand that? Well, you, you guys, sometimes you got to put one and one together to get two. You know what I mean? Job, the first chapter and second chapter tells you that, right? Of course it does. Luke 22, verse 31 and 32, Jesus says to Peter, Satan has sought permission to sift you like wheat, and he got permission. Now listen to me. The devil seeks permission from God to participate in the plan of God. Do you understand that? But listen to the second line. Listen to this now. While God seeks both the unbeliever and the believer to, to, to participate in the plan of God. Isn't that interesting? Luke 19, talking to Zacharias, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, in, jo in, John 19, in uh, Luke 19. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Elijah, listen, he, he, he got Elijah and he said, I want three guys. You, Elijah, I want the king, and I want Obadiah. They won't play, won't play ball, so he brings out a whole new team. He says, I want, I want him, him, and him, and him, and I want you to anoint him. You see, <laughs> even the devil has to seek permission to participate. But see, when it comes to the believer, God seeks you. He's seeking you today. Why, he's saying to you, why aren't you participating with me in my plan? Why are you dragging your feet? What are you waiting on? You think you got to have a little nest someplace, a little cave that you can make into a little, a little place to stay, your little comfort zone? Listen, there is no, there is no true comfort zone apart from your comfort in God. There is none. You can search the world over. You will not find one. The message in verses 11 and 12 of John 19, in 1 Kings 19, God was preparing Elijah for a new assignment in the plan of God. When you, when you look at verse 11, what did God command Elijah to do? Where is he? He's in a cave. What's he telling him to do? Go out and stand on the edge of the cave, right? That's what he tells me. In fact, he commands him. And he tells him, I want you to go out and I want you to stand before the Lord. See, you got to quit hiding. What you hiding from? You got to quit hiding. You got to get bold. You've got to live by faith, not by sight. You got to live in the power of the spirit, not the power of the, in the weakness of the flesh. You got to live in the power of the spirit, not the weakness of the flesh. You got to take a stand. Do you see that? What three visual aids did God give Elijah of the Lord passing by? Right? The Lord passing by. Well, he gave him a strong wind. It was tearing the mountain up, wasn't it? And if that wasn't enough, God sent an earthquake to the mountain. If that wasn't enough, he set the mountain on fire. On fire. 
I said, I said that for the benefit of my family in Michigan that might be listening to me. Far. Set a fire. When I first came to South, I could not, when people would say fire or far, I didn't know if they meant a distance. I didn't know if they meant like a fair that you go with, you know, in the fall of the year. I, I couldn't hear it. Now I can hear it. I can hear it. I can, I can, sp I can speak it now. which is kind of interesting to me. Three visual, they, they were visual aids of the Lord passing by. Listen to this question. What was not present in these three spiritual visual aids? The Lord. The Lord wasn't present in any of them, but he was passing by. But Elijah couldn't see him. Elijah couldn't, he, he, he was so mesmerized by what was going on rather than pay attention to the Lord. And that was a picture of Elijah's personal life. Like concrete, all, all mixed up and permanently set. And the Lord was passing by and he couldn't pay attention. Oh, oh, oh my goodness! The stones are rolling! The strong wind! Oh, and, and, uh, it's like, oh my God! It's an earthquake! Oh, oh no! A fire! A fire! Of course. The last thing he was looking for was the Lord passing by. It was a picture. It was an eternal picture of what was going on in Elijah's life. That's old man cosmos diabolicus thinking on a day when God wants you to be spiritual. Send him to the mountain of God to have a spiritual experience. <laughs> what was the audio aid? Well, it was used as a whisper. The still, small voice of God. The last time the word of the Lord spoke, it spoke very clear and loud. This time, he's going to ask the same question but he's going to do it in a soft, quiet, relaxed tone. What's he ask? What, what are you doing here, Elijah? How'd you like the movie? I noticed you got popcorn, but you're not eating it. Ah! You didn't like my Halloween movie. Ah! You scare me, Lord. Still small voice, the whisper. Let me give you a couple of doctrinal points. Our spiritual failures do not hinder the plan of God. Only our participation in it. Let me tell you, the plan of God depends on the sovereignty of God. Your participation in it depends on volition acting upon faith. Make sure you get that in your heart. The next time you read Matthew 8, 24 through 27 in a boat on a stormy sea, read Psalms 107, 29, and see the plan of God working. Oh, I just gave you, I hope you will read that and connect them. The mantle. The national prophets wore the mantle for Christ. Is a mantle for Christ. Elijah wore it. Elisha will wear it. John the Baptist will wear it. And Christ won't because he is the mantle. 
when you read the verses 13 and 14 about the mantle, what did Elijah hear that caused him to wrap his face in the mantle? He heard the still, small voice of God asking him questions. What was the spiritual purpose for wrapping his face in the mantle? You need to read Exodus 3, 5, and 6, and Exodus 33, 18 through 23. That's connected with the glory of God. Now listen to me. Here's what you don't realize. We live in the church age where the glory of God is all over us. You need to read 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, 3 and 4, and read it seriously. God uses different methods to get our attention when we are running away from the directive will of God. And we should pay attention to the messages that, they, that these experiences are giving us regarding our relationship with God. Boy, you want to pay attention to that. Most of the time, you focus on the mess and not the message. Focus on the message, not the mess. You can work your way out of the mess if you got the message. To hear God's whisper in the midst of a storm of life requires spiritual concentration. The fifth doctrinal point. Spiritual advancing believer must become aware of not substituting a cave for God. The cave represented Elijah's insecurity towards God, where his security was. Your security is always in God. It's not in, it's, it's not in a vaccine. It's in God we trust. whether it's on a dollar bill or on a vaccine bottle. In God we trust. The fear, listen, you've got to conquer fear now. The vaccine, if you're waiting for a vaccine to get over your fear, that's not the cause of it. This virus is not the cause of you flopping in. You're always flopping in and out of fear. This is just another one of those occasions. This one has stayed longer. You've got to conquer fear in your life. You do that by faith. My, 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 people. I shouldn't have to walk you through this holding your hand. God wants Elijah to apply the directive will of God to the plan of God. God wants new man, divine viewpoint, categorical Bible doctrine thinking out of this man. Because God has a plan and he wants him to participate. Now he can't. He's got to bench him. But he still got him. He still got to be a prophet with an assignment. He's got to anoint a king. He's got a, a, the, the king of, of Syria or Assyria, Syria, and the king of the North Kingdom, Israel, and a prophet. And notice he says, in your place. <laughs> We're going to anoint him in your place. In your place. The seventh doctrinal point, the plan of God is not dependent upon any one man except the God-man Jesus Christ. <laughs> What's going to happen to Doctrinal Studies Church? Where'd it come from? If it came to the right place, it'll go to the right place. It'll carry the ball down to where it's supposed to go. If we've done the right thing, we'll carry that ball to the finish line.
If we're, if we're part of the church of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ exists. Listen, they've all had different names, have they not? The church of Ephesus, the church of Corinth, the church of Rome, they've all had different names. Church is still in existence, right? We'd be faithful on our tour. The name will change, the church will. Never about the name, it's about the church. Church of Corinth. Now there was a church in Birmingham. We call the Doctrinal Studies Bible Church. What will happen? No, nothing. What will happen? The church will go on as part of the plan of God. It's your privilege to carry the ball. You know, some people played under Bear Bryant. Some people play under another coach, yada, yada, yada. Church will exist. It's whether or not we leave our footprint. If we leave people actively engaged in the word of God in their life and they pass it on to other people, we've been successful. What's going to happen to us? Who knows and who cares, right? Our job is just to be faithful and carry the ball to the finish line, right? We're to run the race that's been set before us and we'll do that. I don't know. Maybe that helps you. I don't know. I know this, that Elijah, who thought he was the only need that had not bowed to Baal, there were seven, God had seven other, he had 7,000 others prepared for a spiritual reformation in Israel. 7,000 ready, waiting on Elijah to say, let's go. But you can't do it in a cave. You have to do it in the city. You got to take it. You got to take it to the nation. What are you doing way down here when you should be way up there? The worst alone. And he kept saying this over and over. I'm alone. I'm alone. I'm alone. The worst alone is when a believer chooses to abandon the directive will of God and the need for the presence of God in his daily life. Listen, you can be alone and not lonely. Lonely is a state of mind. You should never, listen, you should never be lonely when you're alone because you're never alone. You've believed a lie from the devil. Are you ever alone? No, Hebrews 13, 5. I'm with you. I, listen, God is, is, is with you all the way. Right? I will what? Never leave you nor forsake you. Those are powerful words, right? Who can say that? Who can ever say that and fulfill that? I mean, volitionally you could, but listen, sometimes you can't. My wife spoke those words at the altar to me. The wedding altar. I understand what that means. You can be alone, not lonely. The truth of the matter is never let the devil tell you you're alone. He, he, he bought, listen, Elijah bought into a lie. He was not alone. Listen, he was in a cave and God was passing by. Listen, when he passes by you, he'll speak in a what kind of voice? Whisper, you need to pay attention, whisper. And you know when he whispers? When everything else in, you, in your life is loud. <laughs> the fire is big, the storm is big, the earthquake's big, everybody's big. Ah! Here's God. <laughs> What's he trying to do? He's trying to get you out of fear and into faith where you can hear with your ears the voice of God speak to your heart of hearts. Well, looks like I've pushed into lunchtime, so let's go home. Let's pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. Make us warriors. 
we've been born again, we have established ourselves in the word of God to be a warrior. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, 10 through 17, a warrior every day. Not just one day out of the week. We're not just a warrior on Sunday. Every day. Every day we fight in the invisible war of the angelic conflict. Our job is to be faithful. Put on the armor. Play defense and play offense. Never surrender defense nor offense. Be a warrior. Can't be a warrior with fear in your heart. But you can be a warrior with faith in your heart, and David proved that to us. You don't have to have a whole lot of doctrine or a whole lot of equipment. You just have faith in what you know to be true. David said, this is what I know to be true, and upon that I stand. I put my life at risk, which is not even a risk for me because of victory. Victory is in the Lord. The, battles, the, 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 the fight is mine, the battle is the Lord, and the victory is his. There was a day when David understood that. There was a day when Elijah understood it. There's a day when we understand it. Now is the day to apply it. Make us warriors, Father. Make us warriors, not cowards. In Jesus' name, amen.